Welcome to Risk Management World News. I'm your host, Shane Chernoff. Our top story tonight, the Tohoku earthquakes and tsunami in Japan has left the auto manufacturing industry reeling. Various losses, direct and indirect, were recorded by auto manufacturers in Japan and around the world following the devastating natural disasters. As a result, there were direct losses from these disasters, including total and partial shutdown of auto plants that affected global markets, and a short supply of water and electricity to plants that were still functional. The industry was riddled with death and disability, depleting the workforce. For employees who were healthy, they had to deal with their inventory of cars destroyed. Dealers struggled to close deals as car colors that were in demand were just not available. But the indirect losses from the disasters were perhaps even more devastating. Profit losses amounted to over a billion dollars per week. The ripple effect of auto plant shutdown was felt in places as far as South Korea, India, and China. Management struggled with decisions of whether to relocate the business or redistribute parts, cutting into the bottom line. All of this resulted in a lack of cash flow and a loss of sales to foreign manufacturers. This brings us to how the Tohoku disasters affected the United States. A number of disruptions have been recorded with plants completely shut down, affecting other plants that relied on them for parts. Some manufacturers have had to make difficult decisions and reduce production in plants that are less profitable moving valuable parts to more profitable plants. Sales of auto colors that are in great demand are affected, as these colors are not readily available anymore because of the disasters. Also, because of the disaster, a consensus estimate is that auto prices will be increasing on popular brands that are made in the U.S., but rely on auto parts from Japan. However, it's not all gloom and doom for U.S. auto manufacturers. The disruption in Japan has led to auto consumers in the U.S. shifting loyalty to U.S.-made automobiles, especially where their Japanese preferences are not available. Now, because of higher demand, U.S. auto manufacturers are also raising production and capitalizing on the short supply of Japanese cars in the U.S. For an example, we look no further than Toyota of Japan. The world's biggest automaker is losing business to General Motors as a result of the disruptions in Japan. Some have asked how a Tohoku-level loss in the United States would impact the U.S., and if it were to happen, the outlook would be bleak. If it were to happen, auto dealers in the U.S. would feel the effects of the disruption on supply, crippling their ability to serve consumer demand. The impact of a Tohoku-level loss would lead to massive slowdown of auto manufacturing due to shortage of parts. Think fewer red and black cars because of the lack of paint. This would lead to supply stoppage to auto dealers or short supply of autos to dealers. Most parts that are used in U.S. auto manufacturing are produced in the U.S. If there is a Tohoku-type loss in the U.S., the industry would either grind to a halt or, at best, produce at less than full capacity. As with auto manufacturers in Japan who suffered business interruptions because of financial losses, auto dealers in the U.S. would suffer the same fate. When disaster strikes, a number of consumer goods fall in demand. Automobiles would be no exception. As such, U.S.-based auto dealers can expect to see demand for automobiles fall if a disaster on par with Tohoku were to happen. Now Japan faces a long road to recovery after Tohoku. Sourcing of capital to rebuild will probably be more expensive than before the disaster. The backlog of orders is sure to put pressure on parts manufacturers to work extra shifts in order to get caught up. Restoring electricity and gas will also be time-consuming. And after automakers source parts from foreign manufacturers, Japanese automakers may struggle to get back into good favor and could lose revenue from parts manufacturers who have shifted operations elsewhere. Nissan Motor Company is already moving its engine production to Tennessee, which may begin a trend of outsourcing of production. On the whole, there is a strong potential for a spike in insurance costs after rebuilding, and the industry expects the cost of risk to increase as a result of the disaster. 
In the United States, the Indiana State Fair is coming up almost five years removed from a stage collapse that brought on an overhaul in the way the fair manages risk. We have with us the Director of Risk Management and Safety from the Indiana Fairgrounds, Ryan Danielle. Thanks for being on with us, Ryan. Thank you for inviting me here today. I'm very excited to be here. Well, Ryan, it's been almost five years since the tragic stage collapse during the State Fair that killed seven people and injured 58 others. Can you summarize from a risk management perspective what has changed for the Indiana Fairgrounds since then? The past five years have brought a significant amount of change in how we view risk and safety. It is difficult to summarize all the changes that have taken place, but I can say that we've completely retooled our risk management and safety mission in our operations throughout our entire organization. We are taking a holistic approach in managing our risk. It is unfortunate that such a tragic event, such as the stage collapse, triggered our retooling. But nevertheless, we have grown leaps and bounds in how we review, communicate, and manage risk. Our primary goal is to keep each and every visitor and participant safe for all events that take place at the Indiana Fairgrounds. So how is the Indiana Fairgrounds viewing risks from a holistic perspective? Absolutely. I would love to explain how we are viewing risks throughout our entire organization from an enterprise level. Over the past five years, we have held regular meetings, sometimes weekly or monthly, depending upon our current event schedule and changes in risk. Our meetings are called Risk Assessments and Discussions, also known as RAD meetings. In these meetings, we have participation from each business unit within our organization, including senior management. With the help and guidance of outside consultants and other risk managers, we currently utilize a six-step process for our enterprise risk management platform. Step one is risk identification. We begin by separating our risks within four categories, hazard, financial, operational, and strategic. Step two is where we analyze and quantify those risks. This is a very important step in quantifying our risks and exposures. This is really the math and science behind our risk portfolio. Step three is integration, where we aggregate all of our risks. We look for correlations among those risks and review how our decisions may impact our entire portfolio of risks. Step four is where we assess and prioritize. This step helps us communicate and address our most significant exposures throughout our organization. Step five is treating and exploitation. We develop a strategy aimed to avoid, retain, reduce, or exploit our specific risks. And finally, step six is monitor and review. This phase is continuous and communication is key in how we review and measure our results. I would say our confidence level is very high right now and we are very proud in our progress. Do we have lingering concerns? I think the answer, unfortunately, will always be yes. We can always look back at the stage collapse and remind ourselves that we could do more. We can improve on our process and our procedures. I personally always think back to what was in our control that night and what was not. What we can control is the physical environment, such as the staging area, overhead structures, equipment vehicles, security bearers, emergency personnel, and others. But there were exposures outside of our control, and for the most part, there will always be factors and conditions outside of our control. Those exposures include the weather conditions, the direction of how physical structures sway or fall, the emotional decisions that participants made and the reactions to the situation. Because of these uncontrollable factors, we will remain vigilant in addressing our exposures so we are prepared and confident in how we operate as an organization. We understand that not all conditions and events will be within our control. This is why we will continue to evolve our risk management process by measuring, monitoring, and reviewing our results. Ryan Danielle, the Director of Risk Management and Safety at the Indiana Fairgrounds, here with us on Risk Management World News. For more information on the Indiana Fair, just go visit IndieFair.com. How has your confidence level increased in your ability to manage risk since you adopted this current ERM platform? Due to the stage collapse, you know, are there any lingering concerns? So the State Fair did receive some criticism back then for reopening two days after the collapse. If you had to make that call now, would you still make the same decision today? That is a great question and you're putting me on the spot. We looked at the other unfortunate and tragic instances involving stage collapses during concert events that happen through around the world. We noticed that the majority of organizations and venue operations made the strategic business decision to move forward and continue operations shortly after the incidents. As you may recall, we held our memorial service and closed our doors for a day, which I believe was the right decision at the time. I also agreed with the decision to open up our doors the succeeding day. 
The people of Indiana rely on the state fair as a source of livelihood. It was a very difficult decision to make, but we are here to serve the business owners and patrons that come to our venue. We cannot afford to lose those individuals or to have our doors shut for an extended period of time. Without operations, we cannot survive. Therefore, out of the basic business goal of survival, I believe strongly that our organization would make the same decision today that we made five years ago. Director, thanks for being on with us. Thank you very much, Shane, for having me today. I really enjoyed our time. For our final segment, we are going to look at some real-world examples of risk management and see if they can be improved. It's time to Harness the Risk, brought to you by Nationwide. Nationwide is on your side. 